My name is Sarah Lorenzen. I'm an architecture professor at Cal Poly Pomona and I have a design practice called Tolo Architecture and I also am director of the Neutra VDL Research House in Silver Lake. Yeah, it was a little bit, uh, I guess, ser serendipitous. So, um, so when I came here, I was a student, so I came on a field trip. Oh, that was the second time I came here. The first time was that time that I had uh, came with some friends. The house was not open at that time for tours, uh, and it was fairly open in the back, so we sort of snuck in, walked in, and there was nobody here, but the doors were open, so we walked around. And uh, then I came back a second time when I was a student and uh, saw the house from the inside. And then about um, 12 years ago now, uh, the position opened up to be director of the house. So uh, since I'm a professor at Cal Poly Pomona and the house belongs to Cal Poly Pomona, they open up a, a request for people to make submissions to become director. So we submitted, so David and I <coughs> submitted and uh, sort of made up a plan. The house was in terrible shape at that time. It was sort of falling to bits. There was no money. It was not open to the public. Uh, but it had, it, you know, it needed some leadership. So we decided to take it on as a project. Yeah, I mean, it was a little bit. We didn't really understand the extent of the bad shape it was in. So some of it was just being stupid, you know, when you think, oh, this, I can do this, we can figure it out. Uh, so, but when we came here, the first thing was to sort of restore enough of the back house so that we could move in, because so much of it was, was sort of in shambles. So we spent, we did the work ourselves because there was no money, so we restored the house in the back. And then the question was to come up with a plan to try to figure out how to kind of rectify it one of it, the, the first thing we did was to put together a group of people uh, so that included like the sons of Neutra and the university and other professors and some outside people, a couple of Hollywood people and some real estate people and to come up with a plan as to how to raise awareness about the house and the shape that it was in and then to use that. So the first thing is a kind of call to action, you know, like you have to say the house is falling, everything's falling apart. And uh, so it's hard because it's a little bit embarrassing to the university that it's in that shape. Um, and then once you get everybody's attention, then you have to figure out, okay, how can you get, start to create funds, you know, raise funds to start to rectify all of the roofs that leak really deal with the major issues of the house that we're really trying to keep the water out. So that was really the first phase is to come up with just a plan of action to keep it from deteriorating further. And um, so that took a couple years to try to figure that out. And the first thing we did was open the house for tours and sort of start having people know that it was open, send the LA Times did a piece about it, really get the press out uh, for people to come visit but and to that contribute. that doesn't bring in money, no? It is... Well, it does, because the tours bring in some money. Actually, now they bring in a lot of money, because we get a lot of people coming through here. We charge not that much, like $15 per person, but that if you have enough people coming through here, that actually generates quite a lot of money. Uh, it's also a very strange arrangement because I'm a professor so I don't get paid for this job so there's no overhead on the house there's no employees there's no uh, so there's not really any major cost except for the restoration and doing work on the house so it was sort of the, the house is really not that expensive to run once it's once it was restored once it's sort of fully restored. It's just the question of getting enough funds to do the restorations. 
There was nothing in here. There was no plants. There was no furniture. There was no curtains. There was no. <laughs> there was holes in all the ceilings. It's a little hard to imagine now that you see it because it seems it still needs a little bit of work, and it's a house that needs constant upkeep. But yeah, it's a little bit hard to describe what a kind of mess it was in. But it was, it was still beautiful. It was still a really beautiful house, but it was definitely. So anyway, so that was a lot of it was just trying to figure out how to restore, get enough funds to restore the money, uh, restore the house. So get enough money to restore the house. And <clears throat> most people kept telling me and that it was that we should raise this huge amount of money, a million dollars, and then do all the work. I was very snap. I didn't think that was a good approach because it's very difficult to raise that kind of money, especially if people don't see improvements. So I said, no, let's just raise a little bit at a time and every bit of money that we get, we do an improvement. So that people can see, and if once start people start seeing change, then it's much easier to get people to contribute. Because if it's always a hypothetical, like this grand number and you don't do anything until you reach that amount, I think that's difficult. I mean, maybe if you had some very large donors, but in kind of small, like Bernie Sanders type donations, <laughs> that's, that's a hard, hard sell if people don't see improvements. And the other thing is to make a cultural institution. That was my real plan. Like, I'm very interested in the restoration of the house because I thought it was important to make it look good and to make it, you know, resilient and to make sure the water is not coming in and to kind of make it look the best you can. But I was actually more interested in the cultural aspects of it, which is how do you create a cultural institution? And that I think is actually harder than doing a restoration. The restoration is money and the, the right people and the right projects, but we all understand what it is to restore a house. And certainly as architects we know you take money, you get a permit, you figure out what you need to do and then you execute it. But a cultural institution is very different because that requires a kind of a way to get people to really believe in something and to come here and to use it and to come up with programs and to make it a kind of a part of the larger architectural community in LA and to really have it as a resource for everybody that lives here. Uh, and that I was much more excited about like how once we get it under control like how do you create a resource for the many many architects that live here and artists and filmmakers and other kind of creative industry people that you know come to events and parties and uh, you know film screenings and all kinds of little events that we have here and that they feel like this is kind of kind of living room for that community, particularly the academic community, because that's really who is most involved here, is uh, all of the architects and designers and historians and filmmakers that teach in LA. And that's really our core group, that's like the kind of core family of this house and who comes to everything. So the, yeah, so I think it's a house that definitely grows on you. It's actually a very simple house. So if you were looking at the drawings of the house, it's sort of, seems very straightforward. You know, there's a sort of three floors, they're stacked. There's a central courtyard. The arrangement of the spaces is very straightforward. There's nothing like very sexually complex, like an Adolf Loos house or like Arm Schindler even. Um, but he uses other ways of creating a kind of an incredible sort of richness and complexity to the house that have not so much to do with the spatial relationship of, or the, the kind of spatial aspects of the house, but have much to do with the material like ways of using the materials to create the kind of illusion of a different kind of space. So one of the things that people are always struck by is the number of mirrors that are everywhere and reflective surfaces. 
So you have like the water, the pools of water, the reflective mirrors, you have all this glass. And what that creates is a is a kind of illusion of a of space and a different reading of the building. So when you walk through it, walls which would if they were just painted would have been solid uh, right would have created kind of these solid surfaces and would have made the building very clear because you have a mirror and then that creates the illusion of another space and sort of makes the wall disappear so this idea of having kind of dematerializing the house and having all of these walls disappear by through the use of mirrors and even like in the soffits and in the ceilings and they're really everywhere uh, they kind of change the way that the house works and then there's there's also a lot of like you were asking like small details in terms of this very careful um, small incremental changes to things that are hard to notice that allow everything to always slip past each other so in a standard um, like in a standard construction when you have two surfaces they tend to meet at a corner here they they always changed the elevations or the scale of all the walls and where they end so that the walls when they come in contact with each other instead of hitting each other they can slip past each other so the goal of that I think was really to make the house look like it's made up of many many pieces so that instead of feeling like a volume it's really a kind of a, again it's sort of dematerialized and it's basically made up of many components like that game pick up sticks where you put all the sticks down and they're all separate uh, so that's another thing that I wouldn't have noticed had I not lived and sort of been in the house all the time. It's because it's the end of the world, you know, it's a sort of, this is the kind of last, at least traditionally, maybe not so much anymore, but it was the last stop, right, as you headed east from you know, Europe, New York, the middle, <laughs> the middle of the U.S., and you get to the ocean, it's sort of the end of the world. And because it's also the end of the world, nobody really at that time cared that much about what was going on here. So I think land was cheap. There was people who wanted to get away from the kind of establishment of more, you know, more grounded and more institutional cities and go somewhere where there was very little supervision at that time, where people who were outcasts had come here, right, from all kinds of industries. And then also there was a kind of maker culture here, which you know, like the artist world, uh, so like the Ferris Gallery, and you hear all of the people that came out here as artists and took advantage of all of the airspace industry and other kinds of industries that were here because land was cheap and that people were interested in experimentation. So there is the film industry that's interested in experimentation and all the outcasts that come through that and then all of the people who are making things. And then also the fact that it's kind of the Wild West and there's not a lot of rules, at least to begin with. And the land was cheap and people could come here and test out ideas and see what happens. And so it generated it brought about a kind of and also like the kind of energy when you get all of these people so it's not just about architects it's about all of these various creative industries and they're all coming in conflict with you know contact with one another and those ideas rub off on people and then people want to try things out and it really did generate an incredible wealth of particularly the 30s through I would say the late 70s early 80s I think today it's a little bit different. It's this is an established city. There's a lot of rules. There's a lot of money. It's no longer a kind of backwoods. It has a now a different kind of cachet. But I don't think it's the, it's not the same. People are looking at experimentation uh, still because of the legacy of the city. 
But now I think it takes a different kind of effort to do it, and certainly a lot more money. I mean, Schindler built his house, so the Mack Center, which is sort of what I find is this sort of really incredible institution in the city, which is the King's Roadhouse that Schindler built for himself in the early 20s. I mean, he just built that thing. He poured precast panels, raised them up, decided to live in these little weird baskets up on them without any... Like, that was really bohemian lifestyle, and it was like a big empty field. This is a little bit more a little bit more established, but certainly also interested in how can you build something that's nice, but easy to build and lovely and creating sort of these great outdoor spaces and all the things that we love about kind of the lifestyle that's been generated by these kinds of spaces. It's very eclectic. I would say <laughs> there's a lot of different, I think you probably get as many opinions as you meet architects in terms of what is, what is the, the kind of current state of architecture. I mean, for one thing is that there's a lot of schools of architecture here, so I think that is great. You know, there's five major schools of architecture in one city. So that generates an enormous amount of research and energy and ideas. And you have some very wild ones, right? You have sort of my school, which is really a kind of polytechnic, so it's really interested in making. And then you have SciArc, which is very interested in kind of pushing the bounds of what is architecture. And then you have, I would say UCLA too is like that. And then USC, which is a little bit more establishment. But all of these schools, are kind of a big push for architecture because you have it kind of from the bottom up pushing new ideas. And then you have all these very well-known offices that are very interested still in being at the vanguard of architecture, so like Morphosis and Frank Gehry and all, all of the people that came out of those offices that are very interested in formal experimentation and kind of thinking about uh, new ways of using buildings so I think it's but but in terms of a single outlook I think it's impossible like it's just it's like the city it's like a thousand villages there's like a thousand ideas of what architecture can be maybe the one thing that kind of drives it at least from the from the people who are interested in change not to big establishment offices that are building for for commerce, but the people who are kind of on the ground looking at change is really about finding a diff, a kind of reacting against the status quo, right? Being, being oppositional to the mainstream architecture movement of corporate architecture around the world. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> It's just a very different culture to it. I mean, I definitely don't think you can look at it through kind of a European lens where there's a, there's a kind of higher organization and there's a greater public good that people are looking at and that there's a really a public sphere. There is no public sphere in LA. It's all private sphere, right? So there's, everything is private property and everything belongs, there's very little public publicness in LA. So what happens is that you get a kind of weirdly like like pseudo-public spaces within private land. So like this one, right? It's, I mean this is a public school so it's a little bit different but all of these other houses and then they are preserved Maybe this is a kind of two different questions. One is that you have you don't have an overarching institution or really a body that's looking at controlling exactly what happens in all of these spaces. There certainly are s small scale institutions like the LA Conservancy and other groups within the city that kind of have some oversight. 
but yeah, you're right. You can do whatever you want if it's your land. I mean, the bottom line is no matter how well the, how many plaques you have on your house, it's your house and there is up to a point there's some oversight, but mostly people do whatever they want on their land. Um, so the, the preservation happens through peer pressure, through kind of status, right, through <laughs> I'm being very cynical. You may not want to have this in your interview. <laughs> it's sort of the people preserve houses and have them in good shape because they're status symbols, right? So, and certain kinds of houses, certainly this type of property now has become very fashionable, right? So, mid century modern hit a, right, was not fashionable and, the, and then it hit a kind of fashion, became a fashionable. Uh, style of architecture and now it's loved and so it's very well preserved because it has cachet and people are buying the properties in order to have status. Uh, so it's a kind of weirdly that's where the preservation comes in. Now if you have a very unpopular type of architecture, let's say Victorian or if you have something like brutalism which is or even more recent architecture, let's say early postmodern, where there's not a sympathy for that architecture, then it's very hard. Those things get destroyed really fast. So it has to, the things that get preserved are the things that become a kind of loved by a, in a kind of fashion sense. So, and so the goal is, for us that are on the other side trying to preserve things is to try to figure out messaging that can tell people this may not be popular now <laughs> but it will eventually be back in style so you should try to keep it. I don't know. I mean it's a... I actually kind of don't like that question because it always says that there's some other model that's better that we should import into the city. And I think that the mess that is Los Angeles is actually what makes it great. I think maybe the thing that I would be a kind of opposite, that I think too many kind of too many rules that say that that this has now reached a certain kind of level of we that now we have to preserve everything and that everybody's going to be good citizens and everything's going to go into the public realm and we want to be more like New York. I think it's sort of a disservice to the city. Like in some ways, the thing that makes it a city of immigrants and that's a sort of a, a total and complete mess is also what brought so much energy to the city and that actually allowed a certain level of experimentation. And it's not pretty. So the kind of beautification projects of the city, I think, are a little bit a kind of maybe good for living here and for kind of, and I get that, like you want to live somewhere that's got nice trees and is lovely and is clean and all of that, but also the mess is a little bit what has allowed a kind of a certain certain level of experimentation and attitude to come out of the city, a sort of anything can happen here kind of attitude. It's like the LA River, which is like they're always trying to green, and I think it's a great space, but there's there are people that sort of want to turn it into kind of an idyllic pastoral landscape with a wild river going through it. That's never going to happen. It's always going to be a concrete uh, kind of river, and because it's for many reasons, and that's the way the city is sort of built up. But within that, you could have things that work and that, you know, create, like you can have festivals there and you can let people do art projects and then you can let people, you know, I think the city would benefit from being a little bit looser and not to try to be something more established like the rest of the country. This project, well, I think it's sort of like at the, I'm sort of at the end of this project because it's almost finished, you know. <laughs> There's not that much more left to do. 
There's a little bit more restoration, but it's become a cultural landmark. People come here all the time. People know about this house. I mean, we got here. We have artists in residence, and we have events, and we have parties, and it's become a kind of cultural space, and it's financially secure now, so there's enough money to make it run. And I'm really proud of that, like you build an institution, but I think it actually can survive without me now. I think it took a long time to get it up and running and to get it to be stable and to be loved and used. and. But it's sort of like kind of gotten to the, somebody else could run it now. Like, you know, you whenever you build something, there's a point where you can say, okay, it's built and it's working and now I can go do something else. But, so I'm not sure that I will be here that much longer. I think it's in sort of, it's in good enough shape to hand it off to somebody else.